Welcome to Side Effects with an A. When effect is normally used, it's a noun. It's already occurred. Effect is a verb meaning action. Action influences outcomes. I'm Scott McGowan. And I'm Anne Marie Singleton. We will provoke you to think differently. Side Effects, where problems are defined, solutions exposed. Well, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to Side Effects. Uh, episode three. Episode three. So we were just talking before we started uh, about, you know, we're new to this. So one of the things we uh, we found out is Anne's a lot louder than Scott. I'm thinking that's a compliment. Is it, there a compliment in there? It depends. Depends <laughs> on whether you're listening, right? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So apparently maybe I need to speak up. But really the purpose for even bringing that up is, hey, we'd love your feedback. You know, we're new at this. We're learning. And we want to make sure that we're driving value into our listeners' lives. And we're, we're providing real content that uh, is engaging and interesting to you. So if you would, just reach back at uh, www.healthierbirthdays.com and just let us know. Uh, we're learning, uh, too. Any, any feedback from you, Ann? Um, nope. You can email us, too, if that's better, at ann at healthierbirthdays.com or scott at healthierbirthdays.com. But we want to make sure that this content's valuable for you. So please let us know your thoughts. You know, it's funny. The first time we sat down, we even talked about that because you had said, hey, Scott, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, hey, Ann, great news. I don't know what I'm doing either. It's perfect. Yeah. So uh, we're certainly having a lot of fun, but we definitely want to make sure we're adding value. So, uh, Ann, what's going on next week? Well, next week I'm headed to Dallas. So I thought I was going to go someplace that's warmer than here, but I think the warm weather's coming back to Dayton this weekend. This has been a strange winter, uh, but I'm headed to Dallas for three days for a conference and looking forward to that, but I'm sure I'll I'll pay for it when I get back. I'll be very, very busy, and um, I don't like to travel on airplanes because I don't like that it's closed in and I have to Rebreathe my own air, let alone everybody else's air. So, so are you? So, w- when you make travel arrangements, I'm just curious. Are, are you really picky about like where you sit? I no, I always get seated in the back of the plane. Yeah, near the restroom. But I'm not a good traveler. So when I travel, I take. Dra- oh my gosh! I remember <laughs> traveling with you. This is hysterical. <laughs> so we went to New York. <laughs> We went to Washington, D.C. Yeah, we went to Washington, D.C. together, and uh, we were there two days? Three, I think. Yeah, and I might have had like a small roller. Yeah. And would you, did you have two big rollers? <laughs> I had a checked bag. <laughs> uh, it was more than a checked bag. It weighed 49 and a half pounds. Oh, my gosh. It was like spring break. Well, I'm not a good traveler, so I don't pack right because I like options, mm. and I also don't fly well because I get sick. So I always take uh-huh. a Dramamine, and then I just pass out. So I don't care where my seat is. I don't need a first class seat because I'm just going to sleep anyway. Gotcha. Speaking of that, um, you know, when you're out of town and you get sick, like, what do you do? Well, I hope I don't get sick when I'm out of town. But if I do get sick when I'm out of town, um, something we wanted to to talk about today um, with folks, and this is um, good timing because I'm traveling next week, is having access to telemedicine. So... If I get sick when I'm out of town, I'm going to call Teladoc, which is what we use here at McGowan Braybender. Um, you know, it's it sounds crazy, but I told you I don't like to rebreathe everyone else's air. People do get sick on airplanes, and I truthfully would travel with a mask if people uh. – if pe- well, the fear is people might think <laughs> I have something wrong with me. That's why I don't do it. Um, but I had some friends that – Would you talk loud through that mask? I would – I would talk very loud. I would (laughs) shout. It's hard to understand people when you can't see their lips move, though. You have to talk even louder. Uh Uh, But I did have some friends travel to Florida for a conference a couple weeks ago, and three of the five coworkers um, all got sick. That's a big deal. I mean, I haven't been sick all year. Me neither. But I traveled. That's us knocking on wood. I forget where I went. I was somewhere. I think I was in, might have been Dallas. And sure enough, I come back from the airport and I go home and two days later, I'm sick for two weeks. Uh, You're exactly right. And you know what? I'm not real picky. I would love to be able to get like an aisle seat. That's where I want to sit. But I'm not real picky. I certainly don't like the center seat. Yeah. Traveling on airplanes. Well, you know, you don't have to travel to get sick, though. One of one of uh, the guys that works for me a couple of weeks ago came into a sales meeting and I looked at him and I was like, you have pink eye. And he was like, no, I don't. I have allergies. I was like, do not get near me. That's pink eye. And so later that night, um, 
he he sent me a text and he said, you know what, um, I've pink eye, you were right. <laughs> and I said, call Teladoc and do not come back to work until you're not contagious. Um, so it's it happens at the most inopportune times, whether you're traveling or whether you're just trying to work. Um, nothing worse than being sick and not. So what's interesting about that, there are a lot of different paths for, uh, people call it telemedicine, people call it virtual medicine, people call it doc in a box, people uh, maybe might visit a CVS or a Kroger's. I guess the point of this discussion is, is that as the evolution of healthcare begins to change, the way we interact with healthcare providers uh, is going to change, uh, going to change with it. And probably a good example was, uh, you know, and I'll talk about my dad and my mom. Uh, they're in their 70s. And as we introduced Teladoc here at McGowan Brabender, uh, when we first started out, I can remember my mom and dad looking at me like, what? I'm going to talk to a doctor on a phone? Like, you're, you're nuts. I don't know this person. I don't want to call an 800 number. Uh, I don't trust this person. But the farther along they got down the path when they realized, hey, I can interact with a physician. Um, I'm a board-certified physician in most cases. Yeah, when I want to. Right. And it's convenient. Right. Like very, very convenient. When telemedicine first came around, I think there was a lot of concern about how, you know, how is the doctor going to know, you know, what's wrong with me? And as it takes off and more and more people utilize it, I think what people are finding out is they're spending more time with me than my physician spends with me. They're asking more questions, and I'm really getting much more attention. And P.S., it doesn't cost as much. So it was never meant to replace the primary care physician. So in other words, is, is, is the person I'm talking to, are they, bored, are they really a doctor? Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, and <clears throat> are they in the United States? Right. That's and a can first question. Can they dispense medicine? Uh, and I think also, I think a lot of people like, what do they look like? Like, where am I speaking? Like, where are they at? Are they in, are they in my neighborhood? Are they, you know, on the other side of the country and all of that? And, and so, and I think you would agree, we're probably like five years along in this evolution of virtual medicine. Right. I, yes, I agree. And the first question employers ask, and especially employees when you talk about this, is am I calling someone in the U.S.? They just really want it to be somebody inside the United States. They want to be able to speak the language. They want to be able to be understood. Super important. And now with virtual medicine, as you called it, versus telemedicine, you still have the option of the phone. But now you can actually see the person you're talking to. Most smartphones have a reverse camera. Most computers have a reverse camera. So you can see the person you're talking to. You can even select them when you're in the waiting room. Yeah, I think even some of them, you can actually even look at their... Their backgrounds, where they went to college. Uh, And, you know, the other thing, too, is like, what do they look like? So if it's uh, if it's a gender issue and I want to talk to a female physician or a male physician uh, and I get I get some sort of reference about, you know, who who are these people? Right. So, I mean, think about it. Why did why would you go to the doctor? Most people go to the doctor for something that's that comes up suddenly and that's going to happen one time. So on average, people have about two point three what we call ill visits a year. I'm sick. I need a prescription. And you don't go to the doctor to just say, hey, I'm sick. You know, just glad to see you. You go to the doctor because you need a prescription. You need an antibiotic. You need something for your pink eye. You need something for your upper respiratory infection. That's what you want. And instead of going and sitting in a waiting room with lots of other sick people and possibly not being able to be seen for for two days, five days, seven days, primary care physicians are busy. They don't have that time available in their schedule to see you. You can make a phone call or hop online. Um, You could also go to a minute clinic. We talked about that um, inside Kroger's or CVS. But it's a way to access the healthcare system. Yeah, I think I don't think we're I think we're very much alike. So I think if our kids were sick, we would definitely make sure that our kids got to the doctor. Uh, And we would be pretty we would be pretty fast about that. Like, hey, let's make sure we take care of our children. But I haven't asked you this question, but I would assume it's the answer is the same. If it's me, yeah, I want access, but um, I, like I'm busy. So if I can't get access, I think you'd agree you, you're just going to like you're just going to suffer. You're just going to move through it. it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you don't want to go to work sick and make other people sick, but sometimes you, yeah, you but feel you get like pity. you have to. Sometimes you get pity. Right. Well, <laughs> let's face it. Like, <laughs> I'm going to go back to the to the kid thing for a minute. I want to tell you this quick story. So. 
when Teladoc first came around, there wasn't a pediatric unit. It was just for adults. But as they figured out what they were doing and they were able to recruit pediatricians, um, they did add a pediatric unit. Now you can get um, services for your kids over a telemedicine or a virtual medicine. Um, but a couple of years ago, I was, on, I was on spring break, which is actually coming up in a couple of weeks with my kids, and we were taking a walk. So I have uh, twins. They were probably uh, 10 at that time, maybe 11. And my son said, my knee hurts, Mom. And I said, oh, well, you're probably growing. And my daughter said, Mom, we don't think you love us as much as our friends' parents love them. And I was like, oh, my gosh, why are you saying that? And she said, well, whenever we tell you something hurts, you don't take us to the doctor. And our friends always go to the doctor. And I said, well, we don't have to go for everything. You know, we wait and see how it plays out. If you really need to go, I'm going to take you. But part of that is because I think I work in this industry and I, I feel like I should be responsible and access the healthcare system at the appropriate times versus just run them to the doctor every time. And then I realized my friends do run their kids to the doctor every time. You know, it's funny. That's a great point because I was actually traveling out of the country and I got sick. So I went to a doctor uh, and I told the doctor I needed an antibiotic and he laughed. And he said, what state do you live in versus the state of confusion? Right. <laughs> but, uh, I said, Ohio. And he said, yeah, I, like I know you're from the U.S. And I'm like, well, how, like, how do you know that? And he goes, well, one, your, uh, your dialect. But secondly, you didn't even tell me what was wrong. You just said I need an antibiotic. Right. Self-diagnosis. And exactly. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of us, we feel bad. We over-medicate. I mean, for a lot of people, and thanks for bringing it up, uh, you know, about your kids. I mean, we, we're destroying our bodies with antibiotics. Our bodies don't know how to react because we're over-prescribing uh, medication. And we want a quick fix. And sometimes uh, the flu is the flu. Right. It's as simple as that. But I think for most of us, um, access to virtual medicine, whether it be telemedicine or I can look at a, uh, uh, a physician on my phone, I think a lot of us are just a, uh, a nervous. So, I, you know, I think what we'd like to do is just nudge people. So as their employers talk to them about telemedicine, virtual medicine, doc in a box, CVS, all those sort of different areas. Um, be curious about this because I think curios curiosity is one of the greatest traits on the planet. And what a lot, and the reason why I think um, when you said that about your kids, which I really love that, and yeah, I know you love them because you're a great mom. I like I know I watch you with them, but you also being in this industry, you realize that eighty percent of all emergency room visits aren't necessary. Right. And people are using a doctor's office uh, or an emergency room as a doctor's office. Right. And this and I said it earlier, I mean, this is not telemedicine is not meant to replace your primary care physician. It's meant to work in conjunction with your primary care physician. It's meant to alleviate the, the burden that those primary care physicians have with all of those acute episodic events that keep happening where they can really do the real work that they're there for, preventive screenings, coaching, follow-up, making sure that patients are adhering to their their process if they are treating a, a condition that's ongoing. So all of the really good work that those primary care physicians can do, they, they don't need to see every single acute episodic thing that happens to their patients. Great point. And not only that, I mean, I have a great relationship with my primary care doc. I mean, I've known him for 15 years. Something is going on in my life, and, and, and I want to go see him, and I want to talk to him. And he spends time with me, and I have a relationship with him, and he has my medical records. But sometimes, whether it be a cold or, uh, you know, pick a reason, I just want instant access to the healthcare system. And unfortunately, uh, it's choked, and I can't get it. And I'm selfish, so I want it now. So today, and it took me probably two or three years to even get my head around virtual medicine. Um, now I can go right to my phone. I talk to the doctor. I disclose symptoms. Uh, and then I get a text from my doctor that says he or she called in the prescription. I get a text from CVS telling me that my prescription's ready or whatever pharmacy I choose. And then I can do that all behind my desk. Right. And it's unbelievably productive. Right. And you, the interesting point you say from behind your desk. So when this all first started coming about, the idea was that they thought, 
evenings and weekends, they were really going to get most of their calls, and that's when they staffed up. But what they learned is that most of their calls come in between 8 and 5. That's because people are trying to live their lives and go to school and take care of their kids and whatever they do during the day. We're sleeping at night, right? And hopefully we're having some fun on the weekends. But they're they're finding that this is allowing employers to have better presenteeism, reduce their absenteeism. People are able to come to work. When they come to work, they're not making their coworkers sick. So there's there's many more benefits than just the member has instant access. The cost is lower. We didn't mention that than going to a primary care physician. Yeah, because I think one of the things, too, like the average emergency room is about $900. Right. Urgent care is $180. A primary care physician visit is maybe $90 or $80. Sounds right. And a telemedicine or virtual uh, um, medicine option is probably between $25 and $45. Right. Which is unbelievable. So one of the things actually even here at McGowan Braybender that we decided to do was to build this virtual office for telemedicine for our employees. And so I know when we bring customers around or we talk to different people and we show them this room, it's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you have a dedicated space. What, is that, what did that cost you? Yeah, and it was really – it was just a corner of our building that was a corner, and we threw up three walls, and now it's the size of a closet. But it's a place where people can get online. It's private. You know, if you haven't been to our offices, we have lots and lots of open space. Most of our employees sit in a, in a cubicle or an open space, in a collaborative space. So we don't have a lot of enclosed places for people to make a call. And if you don't want to call from your desk – Here's a very private way for you to access the system um, in an enclosed space. Yeah, and all you need is a door, uh, an iPad, uh, an iPhone. Uh, we have a larger computer screen in there. So it's really not. Matter of fact, I think we were talking to our, you know, our innovations department that does all these terrific things for our people here and then for our customers too. And I think the investment was, was less than $1,000. Matter of fact, uh, our CFO, Beth Farron, uh, who's a terrific, terrific lady, uh, actually, uh, there's, a, there's a video uh, that we posted out there on www.healthierbirthdays.com that actually talks about her experience uh, in telemedicine. Once people finally make the choice to be curious about this and pull the trigger and engage, it saves them money, time, uh, and the, and the speed to access is just, uh, it's incredible. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things that we like to do and is provoke people to think differently. And that's what we're asking you to do is just think about what can I do to help my employees when they need to access the system? Is this something that would work in your workforce? Is this something you've looked at or considered? And there's multiple options out there. Uh, multiple different providers of this. And I'll tell you, a few years ago, um, well, we rolled it out here and used it for a year at McGowan Bray Bender, probably six years ago now, before we ever even talked to our clients, because everyone was like, oh, this is witchcraft. Doctors on the phone that can write a prescription. You remember that commercial? I don't even know who did it, but it was the guy that he was, he had a book out, like a manual, like a car manual, and it was an appendectomy, and he was doing that. <laughs> Do you remember that commercial? No, I don't know so what he, channel he you're like, watching, but no. Yeah, well, I mean, it was network TV, so I mean, but uh, but you're exactly right. People are, uh, they're really intimidated by that. One of the things, too, and you know, right now, let's just face it, uh, we've got a lot of people against our government, but one of the things that I really like about, about the United States uh, and our government and, and even the state of Ohio is uh, they govern to protect people. So when you look at other medicine and, uh, around the world, uh, sure, I mean, it's, it's a little more freestyle. But when you look at the United States, so it, this isn't an organization that can just step out and say, I'm going to put some docs in a room and I'm going to push out telemedicine. No, the federal government and our state legislators do a great job of saying this will not be executed without excellence, without vetting these ph physicians. Sure, are there, are, are, there, are there ways we could make mistakes? You bet. But we are protected by an institution, in my opinion, that has our best interests. And we're talking about health care. That's a big deal. Right. And I think they've done a good job of saying we're going to make sure that we've got the American people and their interest behind this. Yeah, no doubt. Consumer protections are at the top of almost every every industry, and every industry that's regulated is regulated primarily for consumer protection. So um, again, all board-certified physicians, all folks that can 
um, that can give you um, their opinion, their advice, and a prescription. And you know what? I've used it probably a half a dozen times, and two of those times it resulted in, in no treatment. It resulted in, you know what? You probably have a virus, and so you're going to need to wait. And another time was you probably should go see your primary care physician. So if they can't diagnose you, they don't. So the good thing about all of this is if, if you're an employer and you're listening, um, especially if you're self-funded, uh, it can save your people time. It can also save your plan a significant amount of money. When we talk about the cost of emergency room, cost of urgent care, cost of primary care visit, uh, physicians. If you're a listener and you, you, know, you're, you carry a health care card with you, um, it's convenient. It's, it's really fast. And it can save you and your family a lot of time. One of the things that Ann said, which is really important, is this is not trying to replace the relationship with a primary care physician. And all of these telemedicine organizations are, are very emphatic about making that very clear. Yeah. And in fact, they make all your information available to you so you can share it electronically with your physician or print it out and take it to your physician. They want there to be a continuum of care. They want your primary care physician to own that relationship. And if you remember, last time we asked you to look up attribution or attributed patient, we are going to talk about that, but not today. So keep that keep that word in your mind because that's what we're talking about here. Someone to help manage that process. Well, one last thing before we wrap up on this uh, on this issue, you know, I'll go back. You came from Fifth Third, <clears throat> and um, when banks moved to uh, virtual technology on their phone, and I was like, no, I always want to meet a teller. I want to meet the eyeballs, and and I'm a people person too. So I like to be around people. And I thought, I'm never going to use an app. I'm always going to pay bills in my house. Uh, and, I, it, you know, now I pay bills twice a month. It used to take me a couple hours. My wife would go to the store or just disappear because, um, well, we won't go into that story. <laughs> but I was just get. Fr- but now, I mean, I sit just at my desk. Just a few extra clothes in the closet. Yeah. yeah. The Macy's bill came in. Exactly. All that stuff. But now I can pay bills, like, in my car. Right. I can deposit checks. Not while you're driving, though. Um, That's why you're early to a a meeting in the parking lot. Yeah, I'm very compliant. Okay. Very compliant. Thank you. So technology, uh, just in that respect, has saved me a lot of time. And it took people a long time to get used to. And some people aren't going to get there. We know that. But it it took people a long time to to be comfortable with what can I do online um, and and how can it – this is my money. This is my information. And this is my health. They do sort of treat it in in the same way. Um, but people will get there. They will get there, and um, it, it's coming. And the, the next generation behind us, they only want to do things online. So if you're interested, go to our blog, and there's a lot of information around virtual medicine. Uh, and then we would encourage you to listen next time as we bring uh, a really good friend of McGowan Bray Benders uh, in, the, in the room to talk with Ann and I. Uh, his name's Mark Thompson. He's with a terrific organization called Aileron. Uh, which is an entrepreneur center for uh, for business leaders, founded by uh, a real gift in our community, uh, Clay Mateel, who who obviously sold his organization. And one of his biggest aspirational lifts is how to just perpetuate private enterprise. And so we'll talk to Mark about that, his gift community. Uh, please don't uh, forget to reach back uh, and communicate with us at www.healthierbirthdays.com. So we appreciate your time. Have a terrific day. I'm off to Dallas. Thanks for listening and opening your mind. If you're interested in learning more, you can reach us at scott at healthierbirthdays.com. Or Ann at healthierbirthdays.com. We hope you'll join us next time on on Side Side Effects. Effects.